I'm so sorry for the delay. Uh, isn't this typical uh, when you think that you have everything planned so good in ahead? And but now I think we are ready to start, and we will let people in in the meantime. So a warm welcome to this webinar about ownership and tenure of land. My name is Camilla Wagner, and I'm the president of Fredrika Bremer Association in Sweden. And we are hosting this webinar, uh, which is co-organized with uh, by International Alliance of Women, Ownership, Swedish Women's Lobby, Winnet, Swedish Women on the Left, and Unison. Now, when we started to plan for this webinar, we had the ambition to cover ownership of all kinds, like money, companies, real estate, yeah, everything. But then we realized we only had like 40 minutes, so we decided to go back to basic soil. Now today we will talk about the gender gap in ownership and tenure of land and what role this play in our outlook to reach the Agenda 2030 goals and especially the climate crisis, of course. Two of our speakers are in areas with poor internet connections, so therefore we have recordings of their statements. And if you have any questions you would like to ask, please write uh, it uh, in the chat and also to whom you wish to address the question. And I will try to include your question in our discussion. Now, first out, we will listen to Anna from Guatemala. Anna Tull is 43 years old and is currently trying to acquire a plot of land from Guatemala's state land fund. Uh, the process was initiated through CUC, an organization of which she has been a member for five years. At first she agreed because she needed a job and income to support her family, but on the way there she identified uh, with the marginalized communities that are helped to regain the territory of their ancestors. And since then she has lived in the municipality of Panzos in Alta Verapaz less than 300 kilometers from Guatemala City. CUC works in over 50 communities around Guatemala, uh, specifically in the regions of Alta Verapaz, uh, Zololia, Huahuatenanjo, and Costa Sur. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce those right, but uh, that's, I did my best. The organization has a total of 4,000 members, of which a little more than half are women. So let's hear from Anna. Lamentablemente, si eres una madre soltera, viuda, divorciada, tienes el acceso a la tierra. De lo contrario, si tienes a tu pareja, tu pareja es el que tiene el nombre de propiedad de la tierra y tú como mujer simplemente eres una copropietaria. La, la presencia de la, la, las, las empresas de municultivos en, en nuestra región ha venido también a deteriorar la necesidad que tienen las mujeres campesinas. ¿Por qué razón? Porque también hoy como mujeres no tenemos esa, esa dicha de tener el acceso a la tierra, nos han acaparado nuestras tierras, nos han contaminado nuestros ríos para el bien de nuestra familia, de nuestros hogares también y también para nuestra higiene personal. ¿va? Entonces ya no gozamos de ese ambiente que le decimos natural. En primer lugar, la gran petición que tenemos las organizaciones campesinas es el derecho de los pueblos indígenas, el derecho también de el acceso a la tierra, también el derecho de, de que se respete su territorio, el derecho también la recuperación de tierras ancestrales, porque también lo, los, las empresas de monocultivo, las hidroeléctricas, son los que han venido a acaparar esas tierras ancestrales, por lo que también ha sido una de esas grandes demandas de los cuales también pedimos a, a que se nos respete nuestros derechos, que no se nos tache como gente criminal, que no se nos tache como gente eh, terrorista, ladrones, invasores. Simplemente y sencillamente lo que hace el pueblo indígena es recuperar su tierra. Nuestra consigna siempre dice que la madre tierra no se compra ni se vende y lo que hacemos es defender nuestra madre tierra.
Thank you, Anna, uh, for that. And thank you, We Effect, for uh, sharing this video with us. Now, I would like you to meet a fellow board member of, of mine uh, from the International Alliance of Women, Anjarite Sirivabu Moyava. She's a lawyer, a legal defender, and a coordinator of SOFEDEC in the De Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, Anjarite will speak in French, uh, but if you don't, don't worry, I will read the translation for you afterwards, done by another IAW sister, Ursula Nakamura. Bonjour, uh, je m'appelle Madame Anouari de Sirewa Bomoyoua, je suis Congolaise de la RD Congo. Uh, je suis membre de l'Alliance internationale des femmes. Uh, je coordonne aussi une organisation locale de la solidarité des femmes pour uh, le développement environnement et droits de l'enfant au Congo. Uh, ben, je suis là pour uh, parler de la question qui concerne à qui appartient le monde. Et avant d'avancer, eh, il, il est nécessaire de répondre par les hommes. Donc, le monde appartient aux hommes. Et si on affirme que le monde appartient aux hommes, c'est parce que nous savons que les hommes et les femmes, tous sommes égaux devant la loi. Et quand il y a un grand nombre, quand il y a la majorité de certaines personnes, de certains sexes, qui doivent prendre la majorité des droits, qui doivent se prévaloir par rapport aux autres. Et par rapport à cette question, nous voulons euh, contribuer dans le sens de dire que quand nous affirmons que le monde appartient aux hommes, c'est parce que la majorité des femmes vivent dans les milieux ruraux et la majorité des femmes qui vivent dans les milieux ruraux sont dépendante de la terre. Ce sont des femmes agricultrices, ce sont des femmes dont leur économie dépend de, euh, du domaine foncier ou des champs. Et quand nous examinons, quand nous enquêtons, nous trouvons que la plupart de, du domaine foncier appartient aux hommes. Et pendant que le domaine foncier appartient aux hommes, parce qu'il y a beaucoup de rapports qui ont prouvé depuis longtemps et suffisamment que non, les 10% du domaine foncier appartiennent rarement aux femmes. Et donc, euh, nous allons dire par rapport à cela que si on met en pratique les droits égaux, si on, on, on finit par équilibrer les droits humains par rapport à l'accès à la terre, nous allons voir que la, la vie économique, sociale et euh, économique, sociale et sécuritaire des femmes sera renforcée beaucoup plus et il y aura un changement sur tous les plans euh, dans la famille, dans la société et partout dans le monde. Et comment est-ce que en République démocratique du Congo, notre pays, euh, le fait d'accéder à la terre peut renforcer la vie sociale, économique et sécuritaire de la femme Sur le plan social, vous savez que quand on parle du domaine foncier, Là, on fait beaucoup plus allusion au pouvoir euh, au coutumier. Et quand, au niveau du pouvoir coutumier dans les milieux ruraux, sur le plan social, ne considérer et n'a plus de valeur que celui qui a de la terre. Dans un village, par exemple, quand il y a, il y a quelque chose, il y a une rencontre, quand il y a des réunions qui doivent se tenir, on ne peut inviter que les hommes, parce que ce sont eux qui ont la terre. Sur le plan social, vous allez voir que c'est l'homme qui est beaucoup plus valorisé que la femme. Parce que quand on doit prendre des décisions dans un village, par exemple, on va, éviter, on va inviter seulement les hommes parce que ce sont eux qui vont prendre la parole, ce sont eux qui vont décider, parce que ce sont eux qui ont l'appartenance foncière entre leurs mains. Parce que là, s'il s'agit des questions de sécurité, par exemple, dans les villages, n'est intéressé que celui qui a de l'intérêt. Parce que s'il faut protéger quelque chose, s'il y a par exemple la guerre, s'il y a des envahisseurs fonciers, il, il n'y a que les hommes qui vont prendre la décision parce que ce sont eux qui ont la terre à protéger. Et donc la femme n'est pas considérée, elle n'a pas de valeur, elle n'a pas de droit de prendre certaines décisions. Donc la femme n'a pas de valeur, on n'a pas besoin d'elle quand il faut prendre une décision par rapport au domaine foncier. Alors, sur le plan sécuritaire, comment on peut renforcer 
la sécurité de la, de la femme quand elle doit accéder à la terre. Quand la femme accède à la terre, nous, nous avons beaucoup enquêté et nous avons des rapports qui nous prouvent suffisamment que pendant les, les périodes de récolte de produits des champs, la femme n'est pas stable, la femme est en insécurité. Parce que quand l'homme euh, voit que la femme va s'interférer dans les décisions à prendre par rapport à la gestion de produits des champs, il doit déstabiliser la femme. Il y en a des femmes qui sont battues, il y en a des femmes qui sont chassées de, de, de leur foyer pendant que, que l'homme veut prendre la décision de gérer les produits de, de champs. Et sur ce plan-là, vous allez voir qu'il y a des femmes qui, qui sont battues au milieu de la nuit et qui vont s'enfuir au milieu de la nuit. Et là, elles sont insécurisées. Il y a des hommes qui tuent même les femmes. Il y a des, des hommes qui, qui poignardent les femmes. Il y a des hommes donc, qui commettent beaucoup de crimes pendant les périodes de récolte parce qu'ils ne veulent pas que la femme participe à la gestion des produits des champs parce que l'homme estime que le champ lui appartient. Sur le plan... Oh, social, on a parlé, donc la femme n'a pas de valeur. Thank you for that, Anuarita, and I will translate now. Uh, so, if you did understand what she was saying, you can go and fill up your coffee now. Uh, I am Mrs. Anuarita Sirivabo Moyava from the Democratic Republic of Congo, coordinator of SOFIDEC, the Solidarity Association among Women for Development, Environment and for Children's Rights in Democratic Republic of Congo. I am a lawyer and I'm also the IAW coordinator for Francophone Africa. Women's access to land is a right uh, that is violated to this day throughout the world. While some reports show that the wealth of a country is based in majority on property and land, some others have proven that 90% of the land belongs to men and women have hardly access to the remaining 10%. This means that women do not own real estate. In most countries of the world, ownership of land is proven by documents bearing the identity of the owner and the main title is the registration certificate. At the time of the celebration of marriage, in some countries, the marriage certificate mentions the matrimonial regime that will apply to the couple. In countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo, the majority of marriages is based on the regime of universal community of property. However, when it comes to making decisions regarding the management of the property, many women have no access to the decision making and as a result they are insecure, inconsiderate and their economy is always declining. How then can access to land strengthen the social, security and economic life of women in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Let's start with social life. The majority of women in the world live from agriculture. The social life of rural women is developed on the basis of actions and interests related to land. When we talk about land in rural areas, we see customary power. In the village of the Democratic Republic of Congo, the customary chiefs take into consideration the people who own customary land through a fa family lineage. During security meetings and consultations, those who surround the chiefs for advice or for a decision in the village are the men who are supposed to be the owners of the village, since it's their land that forms this entity. So here, the woman has no place. She has no social value. She is not honored. She has nothing to say. But if she also had the right to inherit land in her family line, if she was not a victim of gender-based violence when her parents died, if she could take the place of her grandparents and great-grandparents, if she had not been mistreated, rejected, accused of being a witch after the death of her husband, and if she could inherit the property of their union according to the law, she would have value in society. Secondly, security life. Here it is important to mention the daily life of women during the harvest period when it is time for war, insults, beatings and injuries and various forms of violence. All this so that woman does not participate in the management of the products of the harvest, that she even leaves the house during this period to come back afterwards. 
yet she has provided 90% of the efforts of, for the realization of the works in the field, where it is the man who has all the power because he is considered the owner. Many women are chased away in the middle of the night, but if this woman had the decision of the land, she would also have it over the harvest products, and this would strengthen her security. Third, the economic life. When a woman's only economic base is land to which she has no access nor decision, how can she access credit in a savings and credit uh, cooperative to increase her commercial and agricultural activities in order to educate and feed her children? This is the reason that there is too much malnutrition, children not attending school, poverty, early marriages and all other forms of sexual violence. Therefore, involving women in the fight against climate change and the prevention of natural disasters will not be at all easy taking into account all the exclusions of which they are victims in terms of land management. But if these women could decide on their own, or if there were decisions made in their favor in terms of land, their involvement in climate change starts right away and poverty would also be reduced. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anjorita, for sharing and for all the hard work you are doing. So now let me introduce, uh, we, we're going to stay in Africa. I want, would like to introduce, to give the floor to Rebecca Yuga, who is the president of Bali Women's Union of Farming Groups in Cameroon. Please, Rebecca, could you give us a picture of what the situation is in Cameroon? Thank you very much, uh, Camilla. Is that Camilla? Yes. yes. <laughs> I'm really pleased to meet everyone again. I saw Alison Brown after so many years of uh, seeing her. The, today I'll be talking about women's land ownership in some parts of Africa, specifically in Cameroon. Influence of patriarchy and discriminatory legislative laws affect the ownership of land for women in Cameroon. Under customary law, women are treated as minors and therefore cannot be allocated land, inherit it or make decisions about its management and use. Um, there is discrimination on women in Cameroon as in other African countries. Women in due practice Practices that could be considered discriminatory in various areas, especially related to land ownership. When I was growing up as a young girl in my family in the early 70s, a woman is as good as a property, for example, a chair in the house, as viewed by men. So it is difficult for women to access land. Some women's rights groups point out that women could be unwilling to invest on land because they do not own the land. Their rights have been taken away from land ownership. So this exclusion weakens abilities to invest in the use of uh, their land. Co co customary law applies in this predominantly patriarchal context in which women do not inherit land, consequently have no formal control over it. African women produce 60% of the staple food and only 1% of land on the continent. These figures are similar in Cameroon where women constitute 70% of the workforce. According to recent estimate, women in sub-Saharan Africa account for 70% uh, of the agricultural labor force on the continent and produce close to 90% of food products since customary law only grants them access to, but no rights to land. It is important to distinguish among access, use and control. Therefore, in practice, their, their lack of control exposes women to great insecurity and makes their economic situation very precarious, particularly in the context of large scale land grabs. So when we look at the customary law in Cameroon, how difficult it is for women to access land due to weight of tradition, how this difficulty is compounded by changes 
in a woman's marital status. And then finally, look at situation with that of women in large cities in order to show the urgency of solving the problem of land tenure for rural women in Cameroon. The, the, the land right in Cameroon is characterized by the coexistence of customary law and modern law. Cameroon land tenure makes a distinction between registered and privately owned lands and unoccupied lands that belong to the state, but which are used by traditional communities. The 1974 ordinance, which establishes that registration is the only proof of ownership further complicates the situation for rural communities. Indeed, the rural sector is mainly governed by customary law, which has not yet integrated the question of land title. In this situation, women's right to land is a is problematic and unresolved issue. Land is central in the fight against poverty, uh, in the, especially in the rural area. Territorial legislation in Cameroon recognizes equal rights for men and women. However, in practice, women are subject to marginalization that comes from traditional discriminatory practices. There are the ones who own the least la amount of land in the world. This, the, so, so the situation makes them dependent. It is thus necessary to reflect on why rural women face this discriminatory situation and why their inability to own land currently poses a problem. Patriarchal practices and difficult access to land for women explain by the, this discriminatory nature of land management role by the women causes insecurity. Women are ex generally excluded. They are allocated a small plot of land on which to cultivate to, to their husbands and to their family. And, uh, and furthermore, traditional uses and customs lead them to exercise a kind of self-exclusion from tenure use in their communities, which is perceived as a men's matter. Women are subjected to men and the obligations the latter imposed on them. As in most African countries, the system of patriarchal management is, 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 exists in Cameroon villages. This is in spite of the fact that rural women can be mo monitored in the struggle to develop even though they are for the large part peasants without land because traditional customs prevent them from inheriting it. In short, they do not have access to land. Marital status also affect customary land rights. Customary law grants single women a piece of land that they can use their whole life. But if a woman decides to get married, this land returns to her family of birth. On the other hand, a married woman acquires access to land through her husband, and she has the freedom to choose how she will use the land. The majority grow food. Generally, married women only have usufruct rights of the land they use. The marital regime usually does not apply in rural area where most couples have common law or polygamous, polygamous marriages. Nevertheless, it is necessary to understand a woman's marital station status to understand the degree of access and control she has to learn because of these interactions between different sets of laws by religious, customary, civil, or otherwise. In the case of a widow, for example, in Bali, where I come from, and many other regions, when a woman loses her husband, it is common for the family to take away her lands. Even if she has had children, the decision often depends on the greed of her late husband's family members who can argue that she only had daughters or that her sons are too young to claim their right to their father's land. Families that care leave part of the land to the women to, or to the widow to manage. A woman's situation is not stable in the father in futures, so she is taught to that uh, it is taught that she can leave the land at any time and go 
get over to another man for marriage, especially uh, single women who own land and can easily be deceived and taken from them by men. A married woman is considered an outsider in her family. So who can leave the land at any time or take it away at any time. In light of this conclusion, it seems clear that we must find a way to reconcile customary law and common law so that women can enjoy secure access to land. And at the same time, take precautions to prevent their villages from losing their traditional heritage. Certainly, we must look beyond political reforms and adopt a real change in both men and women's behavior vis-a-vis -vis women's right to land, given that women's right to land is essential not only for themselves, but also to ensure collective food security. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that, uh, Mrs. Yogar. I, I, uh, you drew up a, a very clear picture of the situation, and it's obvious that we have so much work to do. And therefore, I'm very happy now to introduce to you uh, Beth Roberts, uh, Director of the Center for Women's Lands Rights at Landisa. Uh, Beth Roberts is uh, a law policy and gender uh, practitioner. I cannot really pronounce that. I think we do the, uh, paste this into the chat instead and go right, give the word to you, uh, Beth, so that we have time to listen to to you and we can read uh, of your bio in the chat instead. Wonderful, thank you so much, Camila. And it's, it's really a, a privilege to be here with all of you today. And I've been thinking as I've been listening to um, Anna and Anna Rita and to Rebecca just now um, that, that the problem is very clear. Um, you know, we, we can see that the challenge for women in, in accessing and owning and controlling land is very complicated and that patriarchy and patriarchal control over land is incredibly strong. Uh, so I wanted to give a little bit of, of a picture of the scope of the problem as well. So across the globe, there are 2.5 billion people who are dependent directly on land for a living. So that's indigenous communities and, and collective and customary communities. So the, the communities that Rebecca was just discussing in Cameroon, that Anurita was discussing in, in the DRC, and that Anna was, was naming in Guatemala, as well as in across um, South and Southeast Asia and the Pacific in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and, and the LAC region and in every region of the, the world. In rural areas, both men and women depend on land for a living. And this is crucial to where we are in terms of alleviating poverty. It's crucial in, in terms of where we are for the climate crisis. Uh, we often talk in terms of the climate crisis about eradicating fossil fuel use, which is of course crucial. The other side of the coin for climate action is protection of ecosystems. It is transforming our relationship from an extractive and exploitative and patriarchal relationship with the earth to a protective and nurturing, a mutual and stewardship relationship with the earth and with the ecosystems. And women's control over natural resources, women's stewardship and relationship with natural resources is key and crucial to that relationship that we need. And those 2.5 billion people and the women within those communities, their stewardship of those ecosystems is crucial. And the good news is that women are already managing those ecosystems. Women, as, as a couple of my colleagues have mentioned, are already the majority food producers. Um, and that is because of, in part, patriarchal roles about what women do. Uh, but it is also, it, it means that women hold centuries of critical knowledge about uh, natural resources. It means that women are in these primary roles as caretakers of their families and communities. It means that women are the foundation of food security for the world. It means that women are the foundation of agroecological practices across the world. And when we see that land rights are so difficult for women to access, 
uh, we need to remember that there are layers of insecurity for women. So there are the layers that we've been talking about um, within the family. There, there are layers of insecurity within the home where women have access as long as they have access through a male relative. And that access can, can change or be cut off if the relationship with a male relative changes through divorce or death. Um, and But there are also layers of insecurity that come uh, from th external th threats. So Anna mentioned the investments and infrastructure projects that often threaten indigenous communities. Um, that, that is a threat all over the world. So we, we see the, again, the patriarchal threat of an exploitive relationship with the earth and a capitalistic relationship with the earth um, that, that when companies or when governments or elite forces do not follow the international standards related to the acquisition of land that are in place, that women are those who disproportionately suffer those human rights abuses within communities. Um, so those external threats um, are significant and often override even when rights are secure for communities for both men and women. So what is the answer to all of this? What is the, the hopeful answer? And, and I do want to say that there is a hopeful answer. Uh, I think we've seen that, uh, that, that women are, um, uh, be, before I get to the hopeful answer, that the problem from, the, the, from our perspective as feminists is that women are perceived as property you know, we often hear this when we're advocating for women's rights. Um, one, of the, one of the most stark answers that we hear uh, in rural areas is, is, why should my wife own property? She is my property. Um, and that is, that is a stark answer, but we see shades of that attitude that women are chattel in the, the way that women are treated in terms of inheritance regimes, in the reasons that are given for why women should not have land rights. Uh, we see shades of this in the United States. Um, we, we still see attitudes that treat women as property. Up until 1974, a woman in the United States could not get a credit card without her husband's permission. So this attitude is universal. Um, it, is, it is pervasive. It is subconscious. Um, I think that probably most of us do not believe that women are property, but of course we are all steeped in patriarchy. Um, it is everywhere. And so as we undo it, as we work to, to overcome it, um, unmasking what patriarchy really thinks about women starts with what patriarch, how patriarchy treats the relationship between women and land. And the power of women's land rights is that when it is secure, when women have true rights, secure rights to their land, it overturns patriarchy at its root. And the evidence that we have for how women's land rights work is that it changes women's view of themselves. It changes their sense of agency. It changes their partner's view of themselves, of, of women. Uh, so it, it changes decision-making power within the home. The women are, are more able to participate in those decisions about what crops to plant, how to, how to get access to market, how do we spend family income. And those decisions have in turn, a ripple effect of incredible benefits for education, for health, for women's mobility and economic security, but also women's political efficacy within their, their communities as well. So this ripple up effect for women of their, of their agency, their, their power within their homes and communities. This is crucially important in a time where we need women to be in more positions of power vis-a-vis -vis natural resources. Uh, when we talk about women's economic empowerment, we often talk about off-farm work. We talk about getting women out, away from rural areas, but because of the climate crisis, we need women to have control over land. We need to be investing in rural areas. Uh, we need to be investing in rural families and communities, and we need to be investing in women's power in, in, in the context of rural communities. Um, and we see that this is possible to do. Um, I was just in rural Uganda a few weeks ago, and I was working with groups of men and women, um, working with a partner organization that we work with, and I was talking to a men's group that were engaged in social norms and behavior change work with, and they had gone through an eight-week training course focused on shifting social norms around women's ownership to land, and they were saying things like, we used to believe that women had no rights to land, and now we believe that our daughters and our wives should be in our wills. 
Now we believe that we should formalize our marriages. That is a way for women to get access to land in rural Uganda uh, because it formalizes women's rights under law. Uh, a few of the men said, now when I come home, I help my wife with the chores. So there, these, these trainings are actually shifting the care burden for women. Men are saying, we now realize how fundamental it is to our family's future, to our economic, to our economic security, that our wives have rights to land right now. And we've taken the steps to make sure that our wives are on the titles. Um, it was incredible to hear. Um, and, and this kind of programming is cost efficient. This kind of programming can be coupled with legal reform and legal implementation. Uh, this kind of programming needs investment worldwide in order to arrest the climate crisis in order to alleviate poverty in order to achieve gender equality. Um, I know I'm at time, so I'll wrap it up there, but thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Thank you so much, Beth. Uh, that's very interesting, and I'm sure we'll get back to you with questions. But we have one more speaker left, and uh, I will now uh, be happy to introduce it to Professor Govin Kelkar. Uh, Executive Director of GenDev Center for Research and Innovation. And we will uh, again uh, put the bio in the chat uh, for uh, Professor Kelker. Uh, but let me just let, let you know that uh, she holds a PhD in political economy, economy of China. And she has written 16 books and numerous scholarly publications. So I think that's very productive and I look so much forward to to, uh, to, to hear from you. The floor is yours. Uh, uh, are you with us, Professor Kelkar? Uh, oh, I, I, I thank you for uh, giving this kind of honor uh, to share my ideas with all of you, very distinguished speakers. I heard Anna, Anurita, Rebecca, and Beth. And I was thinking one thing, that uh, how women are located in the context of land rights over the kind of across the world. We talk of the specificity, but actually if we look at the history of uh, your modern Europe and the history of early Europe, Oh, sorry, early modern Europe and history of uh, uh, U US and uh, of course the present Asia and the um, African countries, we find that there is so much similarity with regard to the discrimination against women's right to own resources and development of capabilities. And these really run across uh, all policies, the law, community and clan leadership. So this is the, some people call it, uh, it is the kind of uh, vertical discrimination. And then there is a horizontal relationship that among women and men in different social groups, including the family, including the caste and the community. So that would be the, in terms of the South Asian situation. These entail in multiple forms of unfreedoms. So uh, women's unfreedoms are something that, uh, that we need to recognize that land can provide that freedom. Women's dependency on men, economic dependency and economic dependency lead to other kind of dependency. Second is lack of rights to decision-making within home, outside home. And we can take from family to the United Nations and we still have not achieved 33% uh, representation which Vada has been talking about for so long. Limits to women's mobility, that is the, so some countries have parda system, some countries don't have, but real parda is to curtail their mobility and gender-based violence within homes, in the workplace and in the streets. So that really limits women. What is the global picture, 40, Beth talked about, but globally 43% women work on land, but own less than 20% with all the kind of data, no hard data is available. But if you look at economic forum and the World Economic Forum and other kind of OECD record come, then it comes to about one fifth, uh, some kind of ownership of land there uh, in women's name. But women usually have less, smaller and less fertile fields. In India, 74% to 80% of the rural women work on land. But the, we don't have any precise data on the ownership. 13% are operational holders. That is the term that is used by the census. And operational holders is really 
in terms of um, managers. Uh, we asked the kind of government, what is the meaning of operational holders? So they said those who manage land very well. So, uh, but it is not only our analysis. Rural women have been demanding since 1938, the history, I mean, before the, when we were fighting against the British colonialism, that um, land makes us saksham. Saksham is the capable. He said, why do you want the land in your name? They said that we, may, we are treated as capable and we treat ourselves as capable person. We perceive ourselves capable. Second, uh, I was some amazed. I have collected these kind of quotes and quotes in the field work and also ILC has produced a lot of quotes. When land is in my husband's name, I'm only a worker. This is the rural women uh, in Maharashtra, uh, about 100 kilometers from Bombay. And she said in front of the 42 men and uh, around the same number of women uh, that uh, when land is in my husband's name, I'm only a worker. When it is in my name, I take, uh, I have some position in society and my children and husband respect me. I was so amazed to hear this kind of thing. She was talking of children also that they respect me. And I will take care of fields like my children. So this is the, this is what they say. And some women also said, men listen to us because we control land, cash and assets. Only then we can listen to, otherwise we are not lent to assets. So how critical it is for women's position social position, women's agency, the land is very, very important, which Beth also very well pointed out. Why the progress is slow, despite some changes in law, there have been some changes for the land inheritance in India and some other countries also, that women can really uh, inherit land with some clauses, but most of these laws are very flawed. There are some kind of, for example, in 2015, uh, 2005, a revolutionary law was passed in India called Hindu Success for Hindu women, Hindu Succession Amendment Act. Now, women could inherit ancestral property. What was ancestral property? That from the, if the property is not from the grandfather, paternal grandfather from the father's side, not the father, but grandfather's property is there, then she can inherit. So that, and there are joint rights and joint rights is always give the position to men and they can give this. So these are the kind of flawed policies and flawed laws have been made. Lim second factor is limited implementation, very limited implementation. And why this limited implementation, why these laws are not kind of implemented when they were passed. I think this is the major factor which we need to address is the social cultural norms as barriers, women's right to barriers right, which define women's boundaries. What you cannot do, you cannot touch a plow, you cannot do these kind of things. So core production becomes in the men's hand and women do all kinds of routine job, including care economy, which I will not uh, touch now because of the time constraint. So uh, what now is increasing, then we are facing besides social cultural norms, now the increasing climate change effects. Women are the workers in agriculture. So when the climate change affects agriculture, they very well, I mean, in a worse form they affected, there is a differential effect. And I think we need to do a lot more work in this nexus or interlinkages between climate change and gender equality. Climate change threatens the range of human rights in a very systematic way, right to life, right to food, right to health, food, sanitation, uh, housing, work, and particularly it impacts all marginalized people, but particularly women because they are in the large numbers in this. So this nexus, this interlinkages between climate change and women's inequality need to address. Unless we address the inequality of women, we will not be able to address fully the climate change. That would be the uh, kind of, women are trapped in poverty and marginality, and that's why they are get more affected by the climate change. So what we can think of in terms of reducing uh, how the greenhouse gas emissions can be brought about in a, in a number of ways. And I can think of five major kind of things. There can be other also. One is really reducing energy intensity in production, particularly in agricultural production, using the groundwater for the, in place of surface water. 
uh, that has been affected. So that need to stop. We need to we need to use either only a surface water. I mean, they are, they are engaged in Rajasthan. I have been engaged recently in some sol uh, solar energy projects. And uh, I have seen that um, women are engaged in rain harvesting, hmm? water harvesting through rains. And they are running, Rajasthan is completely dry. I mean, it's an arid kind of thing. And they are running the household, how they are managing this. So we need to learn from these adaptation practices. And indigenous communities, women in particular, when I was in UNIFEM, I wrote kind of on the climate change and gender. And look at the uh, Northeast India with regard to the um, climate, uh, how women were engaged in adaptation practices, indigenous women. We need to learn from indigenous and rural communities adaptation practices and finance them. So climate financing has to go to these adaptation practices. That was important. Uh, we also have in India, one good thing is that we have addressed the question of clean cooking, cooking with LPG, although LPG is a fossil fuel, but it is interim best period because it really prevents the death and illness of women and children. How many women and children die each year? The uh, World Health Organization has come, a point, uh, come up with the data of 1.3 million. Every year, women and children die because of the uh, unclean cooking, cooking with wood and dung cake. Enact and implement laws, policies, programs for equal access to ownership and control rights of women. And I am talking of the unmediated rights like two men or two brothers inherit land and that there be don't talk of jointness, that uh, I think we need independent rights of women when we talk of the land rights. This is important because in the jointness, uh, women are so vulnerable that uh, the other party is so strong that uh, uh, he, he tend to manage everything, even if the, you have the right, which has been the case in India. And my last point is really gender balance and planning. Uh, planning for the energy, clean energy, planning for the renewable energy, and planning for the climate change and adaptation and mitigation measures. So, and financing of the adaptation initiatives and sustainability efforts. Rural women are engaged in this, and we need to learn more document, more in this, uh, in this sense of uh, practices that are happening. And that would be really the effort that uh, we, we need to do two things. We need to learn from them and we need also to exchange our practices from what is happening other outside. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, I was uh, wondering if you, I have two questions now in, in the chat and since you are unmuted, I'm going to take this one to you first. Um, as you are mentioning women's involvement into environmental protection, how is this going to happen in a country women have no right in the land, the mother of environment? Thank you. This is, question is from Esther. Okay. Uh, the first question is this, should I address this? That yes, please. Uh, women have no right to land, that is indeed true. But they are working, uh, I, when I gave the data, 74% with declining participation. Although the real picture is 80% 80, 80 of the rural women are working on agriculture. So they are the workers. So they need land rights, but they, besides this, they are also managing and they are working on land. So this is how, and they are engaged in adaptation practices. For example, in Northeast India, uh, the cabbage, when the un, um, uh, this unpredictable rain happened, so their, uh, uh, their crops were lost. So what they did, they, uh, they brought out a kind of new seed from somewhere, from their own local area of cabbage. This cabbage was water resistance. And then they had turmeric. These two things they started producing as the cash crop. These women were illiterate. They did not have the right to land. Of course, some women have the right to land in this because it's a matrilineal estate. I must uh, tell you that. So to that point uh, there. But in Jharkhand, which is a kind of patriarchal estate, indigenous estate, there also women have been engaged in kind of new system of forest management, uh, raking resources. Men are away to, uh, on kind of uh, migration for in search of job. And women are running the entire, entire household. So this de facto right is there, 
but uh, they cannot dispose of the land. They cannot produce what they want to produce. There is some, um, some control is there. They said that uh, women are saying that um, uh, cell phone or mobile phone have become really a controlling instrument because he's working. He means her husband is working in Bombay, but he directs her what to grow and what not to grow. But even then women tend to take decisions because they are saying he will come after three years. In the meantime, I'll manage this. So they are the food providers and food producers. So, so that's how they manage uh, the land. Well, thank you. Now, uh, Alison also put a question that I think uh, we could direct to Beth, and I know you have answered it in the chat also, Beth, but could you please elaborate? Uh, the question is, when women do go to court to claim land, what kind of success rates uh, do they experience? Are laws to grant land rights to women being respected when a woman has the courage to actually speak up and demand her rights? Thanks, Camilla. So I will say there has been enormous progress over the last three decades or so in implementing more equitable laws for women's land rights specifically. So constitutional guarantees at the national level, legislative guarantees, and all kinds of um, laws in terms of adjusting family codes. So this, this issue has been recognized and there's been enormous progress in changing laws and policies. That's true at the regional level and at the international level as well, um, including enshrining land uh, specifically as a, a human right. And the CEDAW committee has called women's rights to land fundamental human rights. Um, but in terms of, and, and as I said in the chat, um, in terms of access to justice, especially for rural women, this is a huge challenge. Um, uh, women lack access because of their lack of mobility, their lack of economic flexibility to, to access courts. So often court fees are a hurdle women can't um, overcome. And the, the ability to get to the nearest formal court is a, is a hurdle women can't overcome. Um, the social barriers are often, are, are often the most significant. So in terms of claiming their rights, often women are challenging a family member to claim their rights. And that can be physically dangerous. They risk gender-based violence if they're claiming their rights, but they also risk social ostracization. And so women often just don't claim their rights for because they, they risk losing everything, really. They lo risk losing their their, their place in their family and their community. They risk losing their, their economic stability if, if they claim their rights. Um, and in, in terms of access to justice in the customary setting, sometimes customary laws and justice systems can be more favorable to women, uh, but often they are, uh, again, steeped in these patriarchal norms that limit women's access to and rights over land. Um, they discriminate against women. It's difficult to appeal those decisions. And women have very little, little representation in terms of decision-making bodies and customary, um, customary decision-making. Um, there is, but again, there is, and I put this in the chat as well, there is a lot of work going on on this. Um, there's a lot of work being done to engage in legal, legal literacy in rural areas with customary leaders um, and with communities themselves. There's a lot of work being done with um, judicial branches um, to support knowledge specifically on women's land rights, and there's been enormous progress on this front. Uh, so there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I will say specifically to the question of, of success rates, um, when there is support for women in terms of um, paralegal support or legal support, we, we do see greater success rates in women claiming their rights. So, so women often need you know, what anyone needs in the, in the context of a court case, they need legal support. Um, but when women don't have that, then, then the success rate can be very low. It's also very context dependent, but I'll stop there because I know we're, we're short on time. Thank, thank you, Beth. Uh, I think we, uh, Jocelyn, we, we make this the last question. And um, what about the role of the World Bank and IMF, which demand changes to agriculture away from domestic production for domestic use to cash crop production? These policies, which must be affected for World Bank and IMF development monies, specifically undermine women's. Let me see if it disappeared here. 
uh, undermine women's central role in domestic farming production? How can we stop the World Bank and IMF from undermining women and the potential for women's land rights? Uh, do you wish to com comment on that, Beth? Or, or... I, would, I would love to. Um, <laughs> but, um, I think uh, this is a I think we're, you know, we've we've seen the destruction caused by neoliberal economic policies over the next, over the last forty years. Um, the World Bank and IMF are um, two of the largest culprits in perpetuating both the ideology of neoliberalism and uh, in in implementing neoliberalism neoliberal policies. Um, we need a different narrative, and I think the feminist narrative that says. Um, the care economy, women's control over natural resources, uh, an economy where we actually acknowledge um, the, the full range of work that women do and that, that people do that does not fall under um, neoliberal definitions of what work is and who economic actors are is a good way to start. Um, but also to say that um, trickle down has failed and to say that we need a, a ripple up economics that is truly feminist and that is fully democratized. Um, I think, you know, how do we stop the World Bank and IMF? We, we point to climate change and we point to the inequalities that have been caused by the World Bank and the IMF. And we are relentless in pointing out the, um, the, the hoarding of wealth that is uh, being done by just a few actors. And often those actors can succeed just by being silent or by you know, hiring expensive PR campaigns to defend their, their wealth that they hide in, in tax havens. Um, I think this is actually a, an incredibly key need. Um, I think changing the narrative and um, pointing out that the, the men, and they are almost without exception men, that are hoarding billions of dollars have lost their humanity and that they are um, deserving of our empathy, but that they are not deserving of our um, of, of being allowed to, to do what they're, they're doing because they are destroying the planet that we all share. They're causing enormous harm uh, to billions of people. Uh, so I think that we must stop uh, that economic paradigm and that we must exchange it for a new one. And that this is crucial to human survival. It's crucial to gender equality. It's crucial to climate action. Um, Thank you for allowing me to speak briefly to that. It's one of my key passions. Can I, can I add a footnote to that? Yes, uh, please. Conquering with that, uh, I would also suggest that World Bank also has come up or all these institutions so, uh, about the head of the household. Uh, and the, all the poverty reduction programs and other things have been calculated on the head of the household. It seems, I mean, China's history is very new when we did not have a head of the household. Once it became kind of open, kind of a member of the WTO and IMF and World Bank, all these things came up, the whole structure of the uh, who controller and the control people. So within the kind of uh, what system they have done. And uh, it is also World Bank goes really the conventional and neoliberal economist. If we go to economic history, you, uh, I was surprised to see that I was recently read, reading that, how the economists have treated women kind of that they can't take decisions, they cannot make uh, analysis, economic decisions, they can do only kind of work that they are told to do that they can provide hot food, they can cook, they can clean, but they cannot think analytically. So women need to be there. I mean, these are the kind of uh, founding fathers of the whole field of economics. And until the time when the feminist economists begin to turn the, and women's movement begin to turn the table. That, uh, uh, so, uh, what World Bank represents is really very conventional, neoliberal, to some extent, imperialist analysis of the whole thing. That is what, and seeped in inequality, that only inequality can produce the growth. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that. We are going to, to, to uh, round up this, and I was wondering if perhaps uh, the speakers could uh, put their information in the chat or if uh, anyone has questions uh, or want to contact you afterwards so uh, they can connect with you. That would be great. And I would like to give Rebecca the final word. 
uh, what would you need from us, the, your, your sisters from the rest of the, the world, uh, in order to support your work in Cameroon, Rebecca? Thank you very much, Camila. I am really grateful to be on this platform today with you because I'm actually not in Cameroon, in Bamenda, uh, specifically where I am supposed to be with my women. I had to go out somewhere to, because of the war and uh, I will be going back home around October to, to, to meet with the women and have time with them in another part of the country, not where the office was located in Bali because of the devastating nature of the war. So I will be back home in uh, October. And to tell you that the truth, I have not been able to effect the, the part, uh, water part project because the school where I was located to start my project is not running up till now. So I have decided due to the war, I have decided to move to another part of the country where I can be able to run my project. So I need your support on the issue of settling down some of the displaced people, some of my displaced women, some of the displaced family who are hiding. Uh, some have become refugees along the borders of Nigeria and Central Africa, all over the place. So if we can bring some of them back to settle down in their areas or in, in, in the area where, which is convenient for them to live back home and even take care of their children and families. Because some out of hunger are dying and some committing suicide at the Nigerian border there. Lots of problems going on. So we just, I need support for that. And when I'm, I, I go back, and uh, do some visibility in an area where I want to carry my part, uh, water part project, I may get back to those who are in charge of the project to give them information about the school where I want to start doing the work. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. We are still in a very bad shape, but by the grace of God and with your support, we are going to get to somewhere. Well, I hear you, we hear you, and uh, we will do whatever we can to, to help you and uh, all the ladies in the areas who need any support we can give. Thank you everyone for showing up. And I'm again, sorry for the technical glitch in the beginning. Uh, this event was recorded and we will try to spread it uh, afterwards. So, uh, you can watch it if you missed the beginning uh, or if you liked it so much you want to see it all over again and uh, also if you want to spread it to to the friends uh, that didn't make it today S so much thank you for for the speakers and uh, enjoy the rest of the csw parallel events goodbye bye, -bye. Mm -hmm.